Is that Little Red Riding Hood? Little Red Riding Helen? Gary and Linda in the house. Carol's in the house. Melanie's in the house. Robert, pray over Pastor Darren, would you? <laughs> Jesse's in the house. Wendy's in the house, and also Wendy. Happy Father's Day, everybody. You can tell the difference between Mother's Day and Father's Day in the church, huh? Mother's Day, they were, let's go to church, son. Father's Day, it's Let's go fishing. <laughs> Fathers, come on. So good to see you all here this morning. I know there's still a couple of people coming in. It's good to see Steve Benko back. and I'm sure we'll have opportunities to make fun of him later on in the worship service. So. But so thankful that you're here. I know people are still kind of trailing in, but let's go ahead and begin. Let's pray, shall we? Holy Spirit, we, we don't want to say that we greet you because you're with us all the time and it's so awesome, Lord. But it's also really cool when you kind of make yourself known and you point things out to us. Lord, I pray for the kids and me today as we look into your word in Sunday school. We talk about how we can see you and hear you and sense you and all kinds of ways. We thank you for the story of Samuel and how at such a young age he understood to say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So even as we worship you, Lord God, even as we express now our love to you, Lord God, our trust in you, our faith in you, in light of the gunk and the garbage and the, ugh, Lord God, that you know all about already, it's so amazing that we can bless your heart, Lord God. Lord Jesus, it's so cool that we can make you glad when you've been hurt so badly. Holy Spirit, we're just so thankful for the sense of you and the joy of you. We know that you love it when your children come together to worship. So we just thank you again for allowing each soul, online or in person, to sense that the Holy Spirit is among us, always doing things, 
Never a time when you do nothing, Lord. We're so thankful for you. Father, we present ourselves to you now. Thankful for our earthly fathers. Thankful for the things that even in the shortcomings and humanity of earthly fathers, you can make yourself known as our heavenly father. So we present ourselves to you once again, Lord, and just thank you for Matt and Linda and Kathy and John and Michael working on the sound and the music. I just thank you for them, Lord. We trust you to put your presence in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we added a couple of verses to this song a, a, couple, a couple months ago, so we're doing it a little sooner, but it's because there's some newness to it, all right? Um, but in preparation just for what we're, what we're trying to uh, bring to the heart of Jesus, right? right? Have you ever asked yourself, what am I going to bring to the heart of Jesus today when I worship? Burden? Is that what I'm going to bring to him in, the, in worship? Baggage? Blame? What am I going to bring, right? And, and so you, you, it's fun to kind of think about that. I want him to bring, I want to bring him some joy. I want to bring him some gladness. I want to bring him a, a hug. A what, you know what I'm saying? I want him to hear me singing on key, off key, that I love him. And you just, you just go there, right? This is what worship is, where we get to express our love to Jesus. And it does say shout to the Lord in this. And the next song, we're going to be shouting some more. So make up for any space that you see on either side of you. Okay, make up for that, especially you, Susan. I want to hear you loud over there when we get into that second song, okay? God bless you all this morning. Sing it to him. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath all that I am never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas roar at the sound of your name. I'll shout for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Okay, just hang on a second. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you is what we just said to him. We just sang that. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. What promise, brothers and sisters? What promise? Don't let those words go by this morning without thinking about his promises, not just to us, but to you personally. He's made promises. Nothing compares to them. Nothing compares to them. Oh, you should be joyful and glad and power, empowered now by the Holy Spirit. My Jesus, my Savior, you are the one true God. You came to earth, gave us new birth, showing us your wondrous love. My ransom, my freedom, power and glory of God. My soul proclaims in Jesus' name, I'll never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down, seas will roar 
at the sound of your name. I'll shout for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I, nothing, nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Hallelujah to our Lord and King. Hallelujah. All right, let me hear you say, yes, yes, yes. Did God breathe into us his breath? Go! Yeah. Has God defeated sin and death? Yes, yes, yes! Did God appear as Christ on earth? Yes, yes, yes! Did Jesus save us by his worth? Yes, yes, yes! Shout for joy unto the Lord, His love endures forever. Shout for joy unto the Lord, His love endures forever. Does God forgive us of our sins? Oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. Had no beginning and no end. Yes, yes, yes. Did God reveal to us his plan? Yes, yes, yes. Did God show mercy unto men? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Shout for joy unto the Lord. His love endures forever. Shout for joy unto the Lord. His love endures forever. Unto you, O oh Lord, we shout. To give you all the glory Unto you, O oh Lord, we shout To you our hearts we raise Unto you, O oh Lord, we shout To tell the world your story Unto you, O oh Lord, we shout Our worship and our praise Did Jesus rise up from the grave? Yes, yes, yes to us his Holy Spirit gave, yes, yes, yes. Are we his children by his grace? Yes, yes, yes. In heaven will we see his face? Oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. Shout for joy unto the Lord, his love endures forever. Shout for joy unto the Lord, His love endures forever. Unto you, O Lord, we shout to give you all the glory. Unto you, O Lord, we shout to you our hearts we raise. Unto you, O Lord, we shout to tell the world your story. Unto you, O Lord, we shout our worship and our praise. Unto you, unto you, O Lord, we shout to give you all the glory. Unto you, O Lord, we shout to you our hearts we raise. Unto you, O Lord, we shout to tell the world your story. Unto you, O Lord, we shout our worship and our praise. Hallelujah. You guys are awesome. I can't wait to get to heaven. Can't wait to see those pearly gates of gold. I can't wait to get to heaven Well, I've never been there, but it already feels like home Well, the only way that I can find the right direction 
is if the Lord is with me, showing me the way around. And the only way that I can keep from going under, right, is when Jesus plants my feet on higher ground. I can't wait to get to heaven. Can't wait to see those pearly gates of gold. I can't wait to get to heaven. Well, I've never been there, but it already feels like home. I can understand a working man getting tired of working. Yeah, we all feel that. And I know there's times it's hard to keep moving on But what are we gonna do? Well, I've learned to keep my vision on the Savior When He tells me to go, you know, that's when I'll be gone I can't wait to get to heaven can't wait to see those pearly gates of gold. Oh, man. I can't wait to get to heaven. Well, I've never been there, but it already feels like home. I've never been there. Well, I've never been there, but it already feels like home. Getting closer and closer. Well, I've never been Does everyone have a, have their wine and bread? Bread doesn't. <laughs> okay, the poem I'm going to read to you is called Full of His Glory. The mountains declare his majesty. His delicacy fashions each flower. The canyons paint his glorious splendor, and thunderous waterfalls display his power. The oceans expose the plenitude of God, and snow suggests his purity as white. With grains of sand of endless count, God's eternity is brought to light. And two trees symbol his gracious love. One assembled as a manger bed, the other grafted, crafted excuse me, as a rugged cross in which our Savior's blood was shed. Let us pray. Dear gracious God, we thank you so much for nature and how it reveals, Father, your divine nature. Thank you so much, Lord, that even two trees symbolize your great love for us, the manger and the cross. And Father, we come to the Lord's table honoring you for your life, death, and resurrection. In your precious name, amen. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and passed it among his disciples, saying, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Drink all of it. For as often as you eat this Eat this bread and drink this cup. You are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Bless 
guys. Thank you, thank you. Oh, good morning, church. I love you. Morning, love you. Oh, thank you, kind sir. Thank you. Anyone remember our text today? Luke, right? Does it say? There it is. Ah, Luke 8. I forget sometimes where we are in our gospel accounts because we switch back and forth. Luke chapter 8 is a great story. I want to read you a text. And before I read you the text, I want to tell you this isn't scripture. This is a text from a friend who I used to pastor with. Um, this is a text from a guy who's struggling. And you may or may not relate to it. But I think it fits what we're going to talk about today. He lost his adult daughter. Um, she was struggling. Kind of homeless. Had been in jail for a little bit. And they found her on the side of the road up in Chico. She'd been hit by a car and she's killed. She's probably in her early 30s now. He lost his wife to cancer about 20 years ago, his first wife. Met another lady, fell in love. His current wife is a wonderful, wonderful woman. Helped him raise his kids. His kids were teenagers when their mom died. He's been through it. Good, good man. Loves Jesus passionately. He sent me a text Wednesday. He says, as I read scripture, Darren, and I, and I lead worship and I lead my small group, I do so with a lot of skepticism these days. He says, I read these illustrations in the Bible where Jesus comes to the rescue. And I'm thinking, not so much. And when I do see an answered prayer or testimonies of God's intervention, I wonder, why not me? This is Matthew 5, 45 says the sun rises on the just and the unjust and the rain falls the same. Is it just human circumstances that come our way? Or does Jesus actually intervene? Or is it just a product of effort or lack thereof? He says, I'm going to listen to a sermon right now. And all I said, I responded, I said, these are deep questions. And then he responded again. He says, I remember. And I, could, I knew he just needed someone to talk to. He just needed to vent some of these things, process some of these things. He says, I remember going through some of these thoughts when I lost my wife. But I didn't have any time really to ponder them while trying to raise four kids and plant a church. Now I listen to sermons and I worship and I sing. And I wonder about so much. John Piper, some of you know who John Piper is. He's a pastor in Minnesota. He's written and spoken a lot of books, and he talks a lot about God's sovereignty, God's providence and suffering. He says, Piper talks a lot about what we learn from suffering. And I do get that, he says, just like sports. We learn a lot when we lose, right? He says, but the biggest struggle for me is just what part does God play in it, or does it even matter? He says, sometimes I think I would rather just experience the results of, of, of things that happen to me in life rather than pondering that a sovereign God perhaps is moving me or growing me through pain. He says, we've been praying for a guy in our group who has leukemia. And I wonder, he says, I don't say this to anybody, but I wonder, why pray if God's going to do his will anyway? Who am I to change his plans? Who am I to actually stop God from exercising his sovereign plan? So, and this is where it gets real deep. He says, so the only purpose for my suffering is my growth? He says, when, when you tell me that, he says, God comes across like a, and forgive me, any of you who were raised Catholic. He says, God comes across as like a, a, a mean Catholic nun school teacher whacking my knuckles so as to understand him, or so that I'm able to handle life in better ways? Or is it just because I'm supposed to comfort others? He says, it seems cruel, Darren. Pray for me. That's real, isn't it? 
That's real. That, I mean, there's, there's, that's, I hope that you have friends and brothers and sisters in Christ you can get real with like that. Because I don't question his faith for a second. That man loves Jesus passionately. But he's, he, he, he's going through something where it's not so easy, you know? You can go to church and you can give the, you sing the songs and you kind of go through the motions and people ask you how you're doing and you say fine. And, but internally you're struggling. Have you ever been there? Man, I'll get these, I'll, I, I'll just confess, sometimes at the hospital, and I don't know, maybe it's the enemy, and then you, then you have to, I'm really riffing now, I'm way off, you, you wonder how much influence does the enemy have in your thoughts, you know, I don't know. How much influence does he have? And sometimes I'll get to, I mean, this is, this is deep. Sometimes I'll get this brief thought and I'll go, what if it's all nonsense? What if it's all just some big fairy tale that we are kind of talked into? And then I'll, I'll shake that off and I'll say, no, God, no. You're real. I'm struggling, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to push on. And I think, you know what, the thing I, I love so much about Jesus, I don't think he's offended by that. I don't think he's offended by that. And that comfort that we feel, that, that reassurance that we feel, that's the spirit saying, I know it's hard. I know it's tough. I know there's a lot you don't understand. I know that it seems cruel sometimes. Hold on. Hold on. I'm not going to let you go. But I just appreciate my friend so much that he, he could get real with me like that. And then I could pray for him and lift him up. That the Spirit would encourage him. We struggle. The Christian life sometimes is a struggle. And, I, and our story today, I think, speaks to this. And I'm encouraged by it. And I hope you will be too. I don't want to leave us um, on a downer, you know. That's because God wants us to be encouraged, even in the midst of our suffering, even in the midst of our waiting, even in the midst of our questioning. God wants us to be encouraged. He's not mad at you if you ever find yourself in that place. He's not disappointed in you if you ever find yourself in that place. Yes, John. Yeah. Well, it's been a while since I read the Screw Tape letters. Screw Tape was a demon, right? Yeah. Who is his boss? She has no, his boss in the book well, it, it, is this is Wormwood. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to go to people. And this is when the body of Christ is so important. This is what we're for, is to lift each other up, carry each other sometimes during these dark times, you know? Pray for each other, support each other, encourage each other. Don't wag your finger at each other. Oh, what a bad Christian you are. How could you ever doubt? I sent that text, by the way, to about 20 of my pastor friends. I very quickly discovered who was empathetic and who would really experience suffering and who just liked to toss out Bible verses. 
you know? People who've experienced deep, deep suffering, there's a difference in them. Um, another great book, by the way, by C.S. Lewis, if you're ever experiencing dark times, a dark night of the soul is a grief observed. I think it's the best book on grief ever written. It's the book he read after his wife died, Joy, um, in, which he re he, in which he wrestles with many of those questions that I read from my friend the very same questions C.S. Lewis wrestles with. It's a great book. It's not very thick, a grief observed. But at any rate, it's real life, isn't it? Wouldn't it be nice if we just became a believer, we became a Christian, and we just sailed right along to glory? Never struggling, never questioning, never wondering, never pondering. And some people do, you know, some people, hey, I don't, but some people are very mature in their faith and they've grown in the Lord and they don't struggle. Some of us do. But God is ever faithful and he carries us along. Um, let's get into the text a little bit today. Luke 8, right? Beginning in verse 40. I think this story is going to encourage you. I hope it does. It says this, as Jesus returned, Jesus and his boys, Jesus and his disciples returned. The people welcomed him, for they had all been waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus. And Jairus was an official of the synagogue. And he fell at Jesus' feet, and he began to implore him to come to his house. Because he had uh, his only daughter, who was about 12 years old, and she was dying. But as Jesus went, the crowds were press pressing against him. And a woman who had a hemorrhage, who was bleeding for 12 years, could not be held or could not be healed by anyone, came up. Behind him. So Jesus and the disciples are back from their little excursion to the Gadarenes that we talked about last week. Remember, they'd taken a boat over to this region of the country that was largely inhabited by non Jewish people. And Jesus and the disciples had an encounter there with an interesting individual, right? A man that was um, possessed by a legion of demons. Wonderful story of God's healing. And they've come back. They've come back to Capernaum. They've kind of come back to Jesus' stomping grounds in the region of Galilee, where Peter, his disciple, was from, uh, not far from Nazareth, where Jesus was raised. This is where Jesus spent so much of his time, in the northern region of Galilee, where he had fed the 5,000, etc. And obviously he was growing in popularity, wasn't he? He was growing in popularity. Now so much people were actually waiting for him to come back from wherever he had been so that they could be with him some more, so that they could see what he was going to do next. Jesus was growing in popularity. They were excited to see him. And we meet this man named Jairus, who was a very influential person in the community. He was an official of the synagogue, a very important man. Jairus. And he comes to implore Jesus to come to his house and heal his only child, his only daughter. I shouldn't say only child because it doesn't say only child. His only daughter who was 12 years old and we don't know why or how but was dying. Please come and heal my 12 year old daughter who was dying. And obviously Jesus agrees. Because the text tells us that he's headed that way. Jesus agrees. But the going is slow, isn't it? Why is the going slow? Because there's so many people around him. And you can kind of picture it in your mind's eye. Jesus and the disciples trying to move their way through the crowds, you know. And people, maybe picture yourself at Disneyland on a hot summer day when it's packed to the gills. And, 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 and it's just, you know, you got to kind of walk around this way and come back. And people are, you know, Jesus is being mobbed. And he's being jostled. 
And people are reaching out maybe to touch his shoulder and he's being bumped. And the disciples, they get over, some over here and some are over there. There's a huge crowd of people. And the going is slow because they're trying to make their way through the crowd and people want to get a, get a, a glimpse of Jesus. People want to get a touch of Jesus. I, I, I would imagine people are reaching out, you know. I, I don't know if they shook hands back then. Probably not in our culture. P you picture maybe a, a, a president or some famous person. People trying, hey, shake my hand, you know. That kind of scene. And it's difficult for Jesus to get to where he's going. He's a rock star, basically, you know. People just can't wait to be around him. And the text says, Luke says that a woman who had suffered from an abnormal flow of blood from her female anatomy for 12 years comes up from behind. You kind of picture her again, if we're making the movie, maybe she's got covered up and she's maybe, I picture her as being kind of little. She had to be probably pretty frail if she's been dealing with this health issue for so long and she kind of makes her way through the crowd perhaps and she, and she gets up behind Jesus. She sneaks up, she creeps up, she makes her way up behind Jesus. Twelve years is a significant amount of time, isn't it? Twelve years. It's time enough for a baby girl to grow up into a young adulthood. Time enough for a lonely woman to suffer and wonder if she'd ever be made well enough to engage with people again. Another text, I can't remember now which gospel author other than Luke mentions this, but another gospel writer says that she had spent all she had on doctors to make her well. It's interesting you think back that long ago, what would, how would, what would a doctor have looked like, you know? What would a doctor have done for her? What, what could they have possibly done to help her get better? Who knows? We're not positive what her condition was exactly, but you don't have to have a PhD in medicine to know where the bleeding was coming from. It must have been incredibly uncomfortable. It must have been incredibly uncomfortable for her and humiliating for her, if not painful. We don't know if it caused her pain or not. I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it did. But at any rate, it had to have been incredibly uncomfortable and humiliating for her. Of course, she would have been ceremonially unclean, right? She's a Jewish woman, bleeding. Um, um, she could not have had anything to do with anybody. She certainly should not have been out in, amongst a crowd of people. This would have been seen as a big, big problem because anybody she came into contact with would have been made ceremonially unclean as well. So this is a woman who had to have been incredibly lonely. She could not have had anything to do with anybody because they couldn't have had anything to do with her because of her condition. She could not have gone to synagogue she could not have gone to worship. I don't know how she managed to survive. The text doesn't tell us. But we've met two desperate people, haven't we? Two desperate people. That's exactly Jesus' kind of people. Desperate, hopeless almost, grasping for anything, wondering why me? Wondering how long my only daughter, only 12 years old, and she's dying. This condition I find myself in for 12 years. And she's dying in a sense, isn't she? Perhaps not physically, but emotionally, psychologically, certainly socially. Two people desperate for healing. And one desperate person we see comes right to Jesus' face. He could do that. Straight up, desperation forced him to be bold and almost aggressive perhaps. Jesus, this is the deal. My only daughter who's 12 years old is at home and she's dying. Can you please come? 
right? Certainly not shy. This is what I need, Jesus. Please come, heal my daughter. This is what I need. And one desperate person has snuck up from behind. This is the condition she finds herself in. She can't be bold like that. She can't get right up in Jesus' face. She can't be that aggressive. She's got to find another way. She's got to come in through the back door, if you will. But she's bold just the same, isn't she? Or I shouldn't say just the same in a different way. She's bold nonetheless. She had to do it that way. Hide herself and her condition. Desperation forced her to be bold as well. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I might be healed. If I can just figure out a way to get through enough people and just touch the hem of his garment, Just touch a part of them, I might be healed. One desperate person in front, one desperate person behind. Both hoping against all hope that Jesus might spare them, save them, heal them, rescue them. Verse 44. It says... Yes, she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. She gets there. Somehow, someway, she makes her way amongst the crowd of people, amongst all the bodies pressing in on Jesus, pressing in on her, and she gets there. She reaches her goal, and she touches the hem of Jesus' garment, the fringe of his cloak, it says, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped. And might I just add quickly here, it's not because there was magic in the cloak. Okay? And perhaps, uh, we don't know because the text doesn't tell us, perhaps this is what she thought. Perhaps she thought there might be some shit. I mean, she doesn't have a full theology of who Jesus is and why he's doing what he's doing. Perhaps she thinks there's, there's magic in the, the cloak, you know, that just... There's something supernatural about what he wears. We're going to find out why she's healed in a minute. But immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, who is the one who touched me? And why they were all denying it. And this, yeah, I'm not not going to jump ahead. This is an interesting statement. I think Jesus stopped at this point. I don't think he's still trying to make his way and, and through the crowd while, while asking this question. Because the, 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 the Luke tells us that they all denied it means, in my opinion, that he probably directed this question, stopped, directed this question at the people around him. It would have been odd to, to keep moving and ask something like that, I think. And while they were all denying it, Peter, <laughs> Peter's funny, <laughs> That's a stupid question, Jesus. <laughs> Peter would be the guy to say something like that, right? Peter would be the guy to say something like that. Peter said, Master, the people are crowding in and pressing on you. Like, in other words, everybody's touching you. You've been being touched since we started. What do you mean, who touched me? But Jesus said, no, someone did touch me. Obviously, Peter, and I'm interjecting commentary here. We don't know, you know, what he said. That's not what I mean. I realize that I've been been being touched and jostled and pushed and nudged and what have you. I understand that. But that's not what I mean. Someone touched me for I was aware that power had gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, how did she see that? We're left to speculate again, right? How did she see that she had not escaped notice? All she ought to do is turn around and walk away. Huh? Yeah, who, uh, who knows? 
Maybe Jesus looks at her a couple times. I don't know. But she recognizes that he's asking about her. Somehow, again, we're, we're left with that frustration that we often have with the gospel writers because we want more detail, right? So we're just left to speculate. It's fun to speculate. We don't know, but she knows that she's not going to get out of it unless she admits it. And I kind of picture in my mind complete and total speculation. Again, I'm making the movie. This is how I, Jesus, who touched me? I want you, and Jesus is, I mean, we, you know, you, you grow up, I grew up in these Sunday school classes where I pictured Jesus stern, and I pictured Jesus serious, and I pictured Jesus kind of irritated all the time. I don't know why. Just kind of had that mental picture that he was very, like, I would imagine that Jesus at this point was probably like, hey, we're not going any further until the one who touched me and maybe had something pretty special happen to them because they touched me owns it. Let's talk about it, right? Let's, let's celebrate this. Don't just have, don't. Don't be so bold as to do what you just did and receive what you wanted to receive and then kind of slink out of here again. She knows somehow, some way that she's not going to be able to not own it. She knows somehow, some way that she's not going to be able to do that. The woman saw that she had not escaped notice. And she came trembling, and she fell down before Jesus. And she declared in the presence of all the people, this takes some guts, too. Because if I'm to read the text correctly, that means she told everything. Why she was there. This wasn't just a sprained ankle, right? This was a big deal that affected everybody in her vicinity. And she owns it. She declares in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And I love this. Jesus says to her, daughter, child of mine, right? Sweet, sweet girl. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Don't you be afraid anymore. Don't be scared. Don't come trembling. Go in peace. Your faith has made you well. Who touched me? <laughs> Who touched me? And she comes forward and she tells him about it. She comes forward and she tells him about it. I was desperate. I know I shouldn't be here. I know it was wrong of me to come and to have contact with so many people in the condition that I'm in. But I was desperate and I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know where else to go. But, but I'm pretty sure I'm better now. How she would have known that? I know one thing. When I woke up, I had my appendix out a couple weeks ago. And when I woke up in post-op, even though I was sore from the procedure, I knew I was better. I just knew. I was so sick leading up to that day, and I just felt better. I knew that that, what, that sick thing in me was gone. And she knew it. She knew that she was better. She was healed. And he says to her daughter, he's on his way to see another daughter, isn't he? Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Don't you fret. Don't you feel bad. You came to the right place. You came to the right person. And because you believed, 
Not because you touched my cloak or my jacket. If he had laid the jacket down on a rock somewhere and she'd gone over to grasp it, nothing, she would not have been healed. There was nothing special about his garments. But because you believed, because you hoped, because you trusted, even though it wasn't perfect, even though it was incomplete, even though it's not full, even though you don't really know who I am completely, even though you don't have an MDiv in theology, even though you don't know your Bible inside and out, right? I'm talking about us now. You believed, just, you, you knew where to come with all of your, 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 your fears and your anxiety and your sickness you just fell, you just came to me, and because you believed that I could fix you, you're healed. Good job, daughter. Good job. Good job. And then we never talked to her again. Again, I was like, what happened to her? There are some things written, by the way. Some think her name was Veronica. And you can Google it, and you can look, you know, there's some documents, not biblical documents out there that talk about her, perhaps what happened to her. Again, we, we don't know, but if you're interested, you can go read. Um, I sure would like to have known what happened to her, you know, where she went. Maybe we'll meet her one day. Won't that be cool? You'll meet her one day. You'll have all of eternity to talk to her about that. And then in verse 49, it says, while he was still speaking, we still have a problem, don't we? And can you imagine the, 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 the daughter's dad this whole time? Right? This is wonderful and all. This is wonderful. This is great. This is super cool. But I've got some place I need you to be. We're wasting time here, maybe not wasting it, but I need you to speed it up because we've still got this crowd of people around us and my daughter, she's still dying. While he was still speaking, someone came from the house of the synagogue official and said, she's dead. She's died, it's too late. Don't waste this time anymore. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. Why bother coming now? But when Jesus heard that, he answered him. I don't know if he went, grabbed the dad. Maybe the dad was broke down in tears. Maybe the dad, I don't know. But Jesus said to him, don't, 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 don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Only believe and she will be made well. And when he came to the house, he didn't allow anyone to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the girl's father and mom. And now they were all weeping and lamenting for her. But he said, stop crying. She has not died. She's only asleep. And the text says they began laughing at him. Now, that's an interesting concept, too, and I'm not going to spend any time on there, on that. I don't know if that meant just a couple of them, if they were, I, who knows. Uh, it would seem an inappropriate time to laugh, right? Even if you did think the guy was full of nonsense, it would seem like an interesting thing to, to laugh, um, I don't know, we, 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 you can talk about that in your class with Barry and John and, the, and, the, and your elders, what that meant. But they scoffed. What a silly thing to say. We know when someone's died, we're not stupid. She's not asleep, she's dead. He, however, took her by the hand and he said to Letha Kum, right? Another text, child, arise. And her spirit returned. This is how we know she was really dead. Her spirit returned and she got up immediately. Just like the woman who touches the hem of his cloak and she's healed immediately. Jesus says, little girl, get up. And the spirit returned and she got up immediately. And he gave orders for something. Hey, She's hungry. Give her something to eat. 
and her parents were amazed. But he instructed them, don't tell anybody what happened. And this is a fast, John, you, bre- you can break this down to me sometime. He's got no problem out in the middle of the road with this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years to tell everybody her life story, right? But for some reason, when he comes to Jairus' house, and he takes just Peter, James, and John and the parents into the room and raises her up and heals her and tells them, don't tell anybody what I did. Now, they're going to know. Everyone out in the room is going to know what he did when she comes walking out a minute later. Fascinating. I hope that doesn't frustrate you that I just leave this hanging. I'm just telling you, I have no idea. (laughs) Why he was okay in one minute with people, you know, knowing. and It's interesting, fascinating. Why and when. Perhaps it had something to do with the people who were scoffing. I don't know. But he says, don't tell anybody. I don't know. Two desperate people, though. Two desperate people. One person who had the status and the privilege to boldly approach Jesus face to face. And one person who had to sneak around his backside, but was bold regardless. And Jesus gave life to them both. Jesus gave life to them both. And I picture in my mind, again, in my movie that I make some days later. Capernaum wasn't that big a town. Jairus on one side of the street, walking hand in hand with his daughter, who was given life, alive and well. And this woman, finally able to enjoy life and be with people and be outside and buy things at the market and be alive again in her way, right? Walking on the other side and maybe their eyes meet. Only for a moment. And they smile. Because they both had an encounter with the Redeemer and he set them free. Who knows if that didn't happen. Jesus, the healer. What, is, what can we learn from these, this, so much from this wonderful story? Faith requires risk sometimes. Be bold. Step out. Why, you know, the, why we talk about this so much. I hope you don't, you know, I work through a lot of my stuff with you. <laughs> Do you know that? You probably sense that theme in me. We, we just oftentimes... Why, God? Why do you do things this way sometimes and that way other times? And it's confusing to us and it it seems sometimes inconsistent and it seems hard. Why? And I get so frustrated with my seven-year-old when Jackson asks why. And I'm so thankful that God doesn't get frustrated with us. He's the perfect father, unlike me. Happy Father's Day, by the way. Did I say that already? He is the perfect father. He doesn't get frustrated with you when you say why. Not like I do. Stop asking me. Or because that's the way it is. Thankfully, God is not that kind of father. I don't want to talk about it anymore because I said so. All of these lame responses I give. Because I'm frustrated and I'm short and I'm tired. I'm so thankful the Father, Jesus, is not like that with us. I know it's hard, the Spirit says. I know it's tough. I know you have questions. I know, and we've said this before, right? Jesus knows what it's like to say, ask why. On the cross, right? The God in the flesh. And in his humanity, he said, why? So when we call out to him and we pray to him and we ask him, he says to us, I know how you feel. I've been there. Why? Why? Faith requires risk. Be bold and keep asking. And, 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 and keep wrestling with him. I love this story. Maybe one day I'll preach it. One of my favorite texts in the whole Bible is when Jacob wrestles with God on the banks of the river. You get this picture of an actual wrestling match. 
between Jacob, who was a conniver, weasel of a guy. Just, oh, I love Jacob because he's such a weasel. He's not a nice guy. At all. You see all these things, and yet God uses him marvelously. That's, all of these guys in the Old Testament are just are, are weak and flawed and frail. And David, you know, all the, oh, I could go on and on and on. But Jacob wrestles with God. And he comes away with a limp for the rest of his life. Come, we walk with a limp, don't we? We do. We walk with limps. We have wounds. We have scars. It's okay to wrestle with God about these things, to talk to him about these things. But again, I, I've mentioned this. You know, the, the, the kind of risk this woman was taking was huge. She had no business being with people. No business. Exposing others to her, to her uncleanness was a crime. Punishable by law. This is why she could not ask Jesus for healing openly. This is one of the more outstanding characteristics, I think, of her. Her willingness to go out on a limb. Her illness was common among women and very difficult to cure. And those of you who are females here can appreciate that far more than and the fellas can. But she persisted to the extent that she was ready to risk everything. Truth is, the only thing she had left to lose was her life, and there wasn't much to her living anyway, right? If you find yourself in a desperate situation like this woman, maybe being safe isn't where your breakthrough lies. Take a risk. Step out in faith. I don't know what that looks like exactly. I don't know what that looks like exactly. I know it includes this, though. You've got to get your family of Christ involved in your stuff. We, we're a family, and if we're a family, then you get to know my dirt, right? You get to know I struggle, and I've, I've loved you so much because this church has embraced me, and I felt the freedom to say, this is where I struggle. This is where I really struggle, and you love me in spite of that. You rally around me because we all struggle, and I've got to know that I've got brothers and sisters in Christ who love me in spite of it. Maybe don't like everything I do. Right? We, don't, we can love each other and not affirm a bad habits or a sin habit that we do. That's not affirming that. But we accept one another and we rally around one another and we, we, we rescue one another. We are the body of Christ. And Christ uses us to minister to each other and love on each other. Hey, so-and-so, I know you struggle in your alcoholism. I know that that's where you run to when you need relief, when you need affirmation. And I wish you didn't do that. But we're going to rally around you and we're going to love you in spite of that. Not because we're saying it's okay that you do that. But kids want to see you delivered from that. But I'm not going to question your faith. I'm not going to suggest that you don't love Jesus or that you don't belong to him. We're going to pick you up and carry you along because that's what we do. Whatever it happens to be, I just pick that out. Pornography, um, our obsession with making money, uh, whatever. We have to be able to, to share it with our family. And I know you have elders here who love you and want you to do that too. And John, can I tell the church that you're not going to kick them out? Yeah. <laughs> right? We're not going to kick you out because you struggle. We're going to rally around you and lift you up. So that we can see God deliver each other and us from our bondage, from our hemorrhaging. Uh, second uh, thing, your faith arrests God's attention. Just as we struggle with our doubt, God sees you when you say, hey, God, I'm wrestling with you and I'm wondering here if you really see me, but I'm going to keep coming. 
I'm going to keep coming. And I love the words of Peter. I love it. And I know I've said it before. When Jesus is, after he's fed the 5,000 and he's, he sent a few of them scurrying because he, he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And he, he's, he's intentional about being mysterious because he knows that a lot of people aren't going to understand and they're going to run away. And they do. And he looks at his disciples and he says, are you going to go too? And Peter says, where would we go? And sometimes I find myself praying in the midst of my tears and I say, God, I'm frustrated and I've been waiting and I don't see you show up, but I got nowhere else to go. I'm hanging on. I'm not leaving you. I'm going to keep coming. I'm trusting you because the, the, the alternative is hopelessness. God recognizes that. Jesus recognizes that. That your faith is not complete, that your faith is not 100%, that you don't have it all figured out, and he sees you struggling just like you see your kids. And I know there's not a parent here today who doesn't see their kids struggling and not have a heart for them. And if you feel that way about your children or your loved ones, where you see a loved one struggling and your heart bleeds for them and you want to see them succeed, you want to see them get up, you want to see them overcome what it is they're dealing with, how much more does Jesus feel that way about you? How much more? Oh my gosh, I wish I could talk about that all day long. Jesus is for you. He is so for you. I tell patients that at the hospital all the time. Jesus is for you. Yeah, but I'm going through this and I'm struggling with that and I'm hurt. This I know. I know and I wish I could tell you why. I can't, but I can tell you that Jesus is for you. And if you don't remember anything else of this long, lame sermon today, I want you to walk out of here today and say, Jesus is for me. Jesus is for you. Amen. He is for you. And he wants to see you delivered. And I wish I could tell you when. I wish, I do, I wish. I wish I had a book, right? And I could say, okay, your thing is going to be over on December 1st, 2023. All right, six more months. You know, it just doesn't work that way. I wish it did. No, maybe I wish I, no, I don't wish I did. God will sometimes make us wait. That's the hard truth of the matter, and it's just, this is the reality of it. Sometimes God, why didn't God heal her after four years, six years, eight years? Why 12? I don't know. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I don't think that's an accident. I don't know exactly how it connects, but Luke makes sure that we understand that the girl was 12 and the, the woman had been sick for 12 years. Yeah. Sometimes God makes us wait. There's growth in it. There is true. Like my friend texted me, why is it just so that I grow? I don't know if it's just so that you grow, but that's certainly a part of it. We grow in our faith and we hold on. And somehow, some way, we're better for it. Somehow, some way, we're better for it. And one day, you know, like Paul says, like now we look through a glass dimly. Where's that's Corinthians, right? Yeah, one day we'll see it full. One day we will. Was that the last point? Your faith doesn't have to be perfect. I want you to know that too. Uh, your faith, there, there, there are no perfect <laughs> people out there, Christians out there whose faith has reached the, you know, oh, don't need it to grow anymore. The, nope. We all come with stuff and doubt. We, we do. And the one that Christian, and I confess, well, I don't doubt, you know, I've lived through so much. I have 100%. Okay. Okay. Bless your heart. Maybe they're out there. I love the, That's why I love the man of Mark 9. Maybe I'll preach on that. I believe, Lord, help me with my unbelief. Oh, my gosh. Charles Spurgeon said we should pray that prayer every day. Look yourself in the mirror. I believe God Help me with my unbelief. Yeah, pray it every day. Your faith doesn't have to be perfect. Hey, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to leave it at this. Insert your name here. And I don't know your life completely, and I know you struggle. I want you to know God is proud of you. 
Jesus is proud of you. You are his son, you are his daughter, and he sees you struggle. And he knows that you, you fall sometimes. He is proud of you. He is proud of you. He is proud to call you son. He is proud to call you daughter. He has made you his home. He lives in you. You are his child. You are a prince. You are a princess. You are royalty. And you have a, an inheritance that will never perish or fade away. He is proud of you because he sees you and he knows what you deal with. Let's pray. God, thank you for your children. Thank you for your church. God, I pray you would encourage uh, these folks today. We come, Lord, limping. We come struggling. We come questioning. Build our faith up, God. Encourage us in your spirit, God, to keep pressing on, to keep following hard after you, trusting you. And God, like I do every week, I pray for a breakthrough in someone's life this week. I pray for a breakthrough that someone would receive a long-awaited answer to prayer. In your name, Jesus, the great healer, the great redeemer. Amen. Are we going to do an altar call today, John? Yeah. We were talking more, the elders have been talking more, just about providing an opportunity for you to meet with the elders, to come forward for prayer. But, and we don't want to assume that you, it, 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 there's no place for shame here. We don't want to just always assume that you have a relationship with the living God, Jesus. Don't be ashamed if you've been coming to church for years and you, you have this realization through the Spirit that, you know what? I've never actually received Christ by faith. It sounds good, and then sometimes it doesn't, and I kind of play church. If you want to make a decision for Christ, come, please come forward, and, and, and nobody's going to go, oh, what? We thought you were a Christian for 15 years. Or, oh, my gosh, no. If you, if you want to say, hey, you know what? I've never really fully given my life to Jesus. I want to profess, I just want to say, my life is yours. I want relationship. I want healing. Then we invite you to do that. If you feel like you've just been kind of going through the motions for you, believe, you're a believer. You believe, but you've just kind of been like lukewarm about your faith and you want to you want to recommit yourself? You want to say, Jesus, you, I, 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 I've just been kind of, you know, on cruise control, and I just want a more passionate and real relationship with you again. Jesus isn't going to go, well, no, I'm kind of mad. We haven't been talking for 10 years or for a month or, you know, I'm, I'm a little irritated with you. We'll see. No, my gosh, he's, oh, yeah, I'm so glad. I want to give you life and life more abundantly. I want to be there with you as you struggle in this. We, ask, we invite you uh, to come forward for that, too. Or just prayer. You know, I, I, you know you, to tell your elders, give them stuff to do. <laughs> right? They, they, these are men of God who love you passionately and would love to take your burdens to the throne alongside you. John, Barry, John, I'm struggling in this area. My, I've slept on the couch for the last six months because my wife and I are struggling. My, I haven't talked to my son in two years. I, um, I struggle with anger at work. Um, I'm not a good father to my kids. Whatever. Have people praying for you. Come alongside you. So we want to invite you to do that. Amen. John, you want to, what's next? Are you going to come forward when it's sing and then? John gave me much clearer instructions than I just gave, <laughs> by the way. And John gives me grace because I don't do that very professionally. <laughs> I think that. No.
We so love your style. You continually amaze us. You have a state of marvel ready for us all the time. Thank you for keeping us looking that we might see what would marvel us. Thank you for keeping us listening that we would hear what amazes us, the promises. Lord God, that are beyond comparison. Father, we want to apologize to you for when we've treated you as you did not deserve, when we've blamed you for things that weren't your fault, when we've been angry with you all the while knowing it's us. Father, we think of those who are online with us this morning as well. Just want them to know that you are speaking to us about all of them. And Father, if there's someone today that wants to respond to you, I just thank you for freeing them to do that right now, to say yes to your offer of adoption, or to say yes to a step of faith for healing, to say yes to a decision of forgiveness. Father, thank you for the glorious experiences that you have for all of us. If we'll just say yes to you. Thank you again, Lord, for our elders and how they are listening and acting on what you are saying to them. Thank you for that model, Lord God, that we would each listen for what the Spirit is saying to us, the church. And Lord, we do want you to hear us always saying that we love you. Always want you to hear us saying we're thankful, Lord God, and that we trust you in everything. 
Thank you for your saving, forgiving, refreshing, restoring power. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.